So um, today, as we say, I, I, I will. I, I'm not very good at give these broad seminars where I will go through my career. Uh, uh, I don't know why. I, I just don't like it. I prefer to really take you through our life story, which was a long, long one. It was seven years for a poor PhD student, and then became a postdoc where we pandemia and three kids in the middle but <laughs> but uh, I I prefer to take you through this uh, so that we can think together um, through the entire process of mechanosensing by dendritic cells so the concept behind is that uh, the biology of dendritic cells is changed uh, by the uh, is it, it, the, let's say respond to changes in cell shape. And this is uh, the concept we put forward uh, together with uh, Giorgio Sita, Mathieu Piel, and Raphael Vaturier to get our synergy grant. And Giorgio is doing the, 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 the work on cancer cells and we are doing the work on dendritic cells. So cell shape sensing, in our case, in phagocytes. So dendritic cells, maybe not all of you know what they are, they start immune responses. They are in your peripheral tissues that are the ones that are most often exposed to infection. For example, your mucosa or the skin. And uh, their role there at steady state when not, nothing is happening is to patch all the environment. So they do that eventually through migration. And importantly, they have this huge capacity to take up antigen at that stage. And when they, once they identify something as interesting, they will uh, modify their biology. We will go later on uh, into what that means, become mature now dendritic cells. They, take into, they get into the lymphatic vessels and they bring the antigens they have collected to uh, the uh, uh, T cells in the lymph node and this will initiate adaptive immune responses. So typically this happens uh, when the tissue gets it's infected, and it can also happen when there's inflammation due to tissue injury or to cancer. Okay, and uh, uh, as I said, uh, it is dispensable to have this migratory event of dendritic cells from the periphery to lymph node. However, what people have also uh, uh, observed for now more than 20 years is that at steady state, when nothing is happening, there are dendritic cells that are regularly migrating from the tissue to the lymphatic vessels and to lymph nodes. And there's one main paper that shows that if we disrupt this steady state or homeostatic migration of dendritic cells, mice develop autoimmune disease. And in this paper, they also show that dendritic cells, they are carrying self-antigen, antigen from the tissue, to the lymph node, and that this leads to T cell tolerance. So they present the antigen, but instead of activating the T cells, as it is the case when there's immunity, they rather make them tolerant, they inactivate them. And it's very important to avoid autoimmune disease. So just to tell you that this is not something minor, in the mouse skin, uh, there's 5 to 10% of dendritic cells that is being replaced every 24 hours because they migrate to lymph node. And this is more than 20% in some tissues, uh, such as the gut, probably tissues that are more exposed to inflammatory signals. But let's, uh, I mean, not exactly, I, I shouldn't say that, not exactly to inflammatory signals, but where there are microbes that sleep, and where immune cells uh, and where higher levels of tolerance are being required. So in both cases of inflammatory, oh, there's something gone here, it doesn't matter, inflammation and steady state migration of dendritic cells, there is one chemokine receptor which is really important. This chemokine receptor is CCR7. Okay, so when dendritic cells are patrolling tissue, they don't express CCR7. And as soon uh, and, and But when they will migrate to lymph node, this chemokine receptor is upregulated at their surface, and this is what will allow them to follow gradient of the CCL21 chemokine that it is, will guide them to the lymphatic vessel. This chemokine is produced by the lymphatic vessels and later on to lymph nodes. So it is well known for many years that what upregulates CCR7 at the surface of dendritic cell when there is inflammation or infection or the microbial products or the inflammatory mediators, for example, ATP, 
would be a mediator that would upregulate CCR7 expression. However, despite uh, many years of research, it is still unknown what does dendritic cells become positive for CCR7 at steady state and allow their migration every day to maintain uh, tolerance and to avoid autoimmunity against self antigen. So um, for many years, we've been, as, as Fede said, what we've been doing is looking at dendritic cells migrating into their different type of environment. And these are dendritic cells in green that are migrating within the skin of a mouse ear. The nucleus is in red. And what you can see in this picture, in this movie, sorry, is that the cell, when it's migrating around, it's meeting a lot of obstacles that are made by the matrix, that are made by the surrounding cell. And it, this leads to important deformation event of the cell and of its intracellular organelles, in particular the nucleus. So the nucleus, when the cell is passing through the constriction, is being extensively uh, deformed, as you can really observe here. So this can be quantified. Uh, and if you do it in the ear explant, as compared, for example, to a, a medium where there's a, a no obstacle around, you will see that the minimal diameter of the nucleus is very often between two to four, whereas it is most of the time above four in a non-confining environment. So there's important confinement and deformations that dendritic cells are undergoing when patrolling tissues such as the mouse key. So here comes our hypothesis. What we thought is that maybe this many deformation events could be sensed by dendritic cells. And maybe this sensing could, uh, when the, there is steady state, so in the absence of inflammation, lead to the upregulation of CCR7 uh, receptor at their surface and license these cells for migration to lymphatic vessels and lymph nodes. So in other words, what we were proposing is that at steady state, the signals that allow dendritic cells to migrate from the periphery to lymph node could be physical signal rather than chemical ones. And this would explain why they had not been discovered despite many intents. So to address this question, what we did is uh, to uh, use a cell confiner where, uh, that we can use uh, to apply defined deformation uh, to dendritic cells, uh, deformations that we can control. So what we control is the height between the two plates uh, uh, in between which dendritic cells are being positioned. And the two uh, confinement height that we chose here are four micron, where we confine the cells but do not significantly deform the nuclei, and three micron, where nuclei are significantly deformed. Okay, as you can see in these pictures, there are obviously some morphological changes that are induced by the deformation at 3 micron that I will describe for, uh, further on. Um, what also motivated us to choose this confinement height uh, were observations that we had made in movies of dendritic cells, so two photon intravital imaging of dendritic cells in the mouse skin. And what we had observed is that uh, uh, the, the, the average cell diameters, uh, the minimal average cell diameters that dendritic cells harbor in their natural environment is very often around three micron. And that in over a one hour movie, uh, actually the cell is spending about a third, 30 min uh, 20 minutes of their time with such a small diameter. So this means that they're continuously being deformed during, uh, uh, during those times. So um, the cells we use to do our experiments express CCR7 GFP, so they are a reporter for this chemokine receptor. And this is the result. What you will immediately see in the movie is that the cells confine at three, but not at four. Uh, first move faster. This is why they ended up being more numerous. And at the end, they also uh, upregulate CCR7 expression. And that we can quantify. You see that after 30 minutes, nothing ha has happened. In, in, in contrast, after four hours, most of the cell became CCR7 positive, as shown by GFP. And this didn't change as much after six hours. So as I said, it was a reporter. So we needed to prove that this was also true when looking at the internal. Um, G, uh, CCR7 receptor, so we label the cells, 
uh, with CCR7 antibodies. And we see that this is really obvious. And actually, this also tells us that most of GFP of CCR7, sorry, is at the cell surface. We can quantify this. And actually, we also observed that uh, the mRNA of CCR7 becomes upregulated when the cells are confined at four and three, but the response at three micron is much more significant. Do we need to confine four hours? No, actually, we don't need to confine four hours. We did experiments with 30 minutes of confinement and release. We also did 20 minutes and release. And in both cases, you see that this is enough to upregulate CCR7 expression at the mRNA level. So this is consistent with what we had observed in the in vivo movies, that the cells spend about uh, uh, 20 to 30 minutes of their time confined in the tissue. And we also show that this receptor is functional because if we put a gradient of the CCL19 chemokine, which is another chemokine for CCR7, well, uh, you see that only the cells confined at three are following the chemokine gradient and are increasing their speed in response to those gradients. So all this together tells us that confinement of dendritic cells at three micron height, but not four, is upregulating CCR7 expression, and we ask for the mechanism involved. And uh, here we immediately turn to one big uh, pathway candidate, which is the pathway by the cytosolic phospholipase A2, so this enzyme, CPLA2, cytosolic phospholipase A2, uh, we had shown, uh, actually it's the lab of my collaborator, Mathieu Piel, but we had done the work on disease that had been published in this paper, gets inserted into the nuclear membrane when the nuclear membrane is stretched, okay? And this, once inserted, it will use the lipids from the membrane to produce, in response to calcium, arachidonic acids from which prostaglandins can be produced, so leukotrienes as well as leukotrienes. What is shown in these papers, actually there were several, several uh, uh, publications on this, is that the activation of CPLA2 beyond uh, producing to uh, leading to the production of eicosanoid also leads to the increased actomyosin contractility. So then the cells become more powerful and start, start moving faster. And actually this allows the cell whose nucleus is trapped within a constriction imposed by the matrix to progress forward. So it, it was called, called the nuclear ruler pathway, which allows cell release when uh, the cells are, are trapped in physical obstacle. It's a very fast pathway, it occurs in the minute scale. So we ask whether this pathway could also be involved in this latest, later event of uh, uh, CCR7 upregulation of expression, which rather occur at the hour scale. So we knock down CPLA2, and what you can immediately see is that in the CPLA2 knockout, there is no longer the upregulation of GFP uh, when the cells are confined at three. All this is our dendritic cells, of course. And we also generated a knockout for the CPLA2 gene that has this complicated name, I will not say. It's a flux uh, allele with, uh, that we cross with CD11 secret to delete it in dendritic cell. And we see that these dendritic cells are also not upregulating C uh, CCR7 after confinement. So when we look at CPLA2 itself, we can really see that it completely shifts distribution between the four and the three micron confinement. It is mainly in the cytosol, in the cells that are in, at four micron confined and that do not upregulate CCR7. And it's really found within the nucleus and probably this pattern is because it's associated at least in part to the membrane. We never reach enough resolution to really uh, uh, see that actually, uh, but it's, it really completely changed distribution when the, when the cells are confined at three micron height. And this is quantified here. So we thought, let's confine them more. Let's look what happens if we confine them at two micron height. And here, big surprise, CPLA2 is no longer in the nucleus. I mean, very little CPLA2 in the nucleus. And uh, 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 I mean, this, this was really striking. It was similar to uh, what was observed in the four micron height. So they were really surprised. We thought, wow, it's really exquisitely sensitive. <laughs> 
but we, we rapidly understood what was going on. I had my, my postdoc repeating this experiment 12 times for mm -hmm. girl. And uh, uh, what we found is that actually at two micron height, the dendritic cells are rupturing the nuclear envelope. So this had been described in the literature and it's, uh, it's, it's visualized here by NLS GFP. So you see the NLS, the nuclear localization sequence that is going out from the nucleus, but then it's coming back. And this is because we and others had shown that it's being repaired, the nuclear envelope. The nuclear envelope is being repaired and the cells do not die. They remain alive. However, they no longer uh, activate the CPLA2 pathway and accordingly, they no longer upregulate CCR7 expression. So this tells us that the CPLA2 pathway is indeed involved in the upregulation of CCR7 expression in addition to increased motivities. Actually, it's interesting because both events are needed for dendritic cells to migrate to lymph nodes. Uh, and that they require for this an intact nuclear envelope. If the nuclear envelope breaks, this doesn't work anymore. And uh, so, so, so it, it means that there's really different functions for, 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 for this en enzyme at different time scales. So the minute one and the hour one. So then we ask whether this is something active. Is, does the cell need to respond to the deformation or is this just passive? Do we press on the cell and uh, press on the nucleus and then the response will cure? So uh, to a good candidate to uh, uh, mediate this mechanosensing response is, of course, the, the actin cytoskeleton, which is the main mechanosensors in cells. And uh, we had already observed, as I, as I initially said, that there are changes in the actin distribution uh, when the cells are confined at three micron high, in, in particular, the appearance of this pool in the perinuclear area and the increase in the thickness of the actin cortex. So uh, to assess the role of the actin cytoskeleton, we looked directly for the function of ARP23. You probably know that this is very conserved complex along evolution that is needed uh, to uh, nucleate branch actin networks. And branch actin networks are very important for phagocytosis, for adhesion, for, I mean, many of the processes where the shape of the cell is changing. So uh, we use a, a different, so up to three is activated in response to small GTPase activation, and it requires nucleation promoting factor that can be wave WASP or WASH. And up to three is also inhibited by RP, which is a specific inhibitor of the, of the, of the complex. So we, uh, to, to assess the function of up to three, we simply treated the cell with CK666, which is a, specific inhibitor of ARP23, it really works well. And uh, what we immediately saw is that we lose the translocation of CPLA2 into the nucleus, okay? So most of the uh, ARP23 is found in the, of the CPLA2, sorry, is found in the cytosol when ARP23 is not activated. And accordingly, we also observe that there's no longer upregulation of CCR7 expression in the ARP23 knockout cells. So we look more closer to what was going on uh, on the nuclear envelope and the perinuclear area. And this we needed to do by uh, time lapse microscopy because actually the actin structures of the cells are very often lost when we fix the cell. So we did that by most of it by time lapse. So here is uh, the lab 2B. So lab 2B is a, a, a marker for the nuclear end block. And what you can observe is that the nuclear area increase when we confine the cells at three micron height. And this is much less pronounced when we have CK666 treatment. However, uh, and this is associated to increase in the tension of the nuclear envelope. Actually, we measure the tension. I'm not going to show the data because this had to be done in, in HeLa cells, but uh, we observe that there's less folding and increased tension of the nuclear envelope when they are confined at 3 micron height. And this at least partly depends on CK666. And we also observe doing this live imaging that this very often associates with this pool big pool of actin in the perinuclear area. And uh, we believe, we don't have a formal proof, but we believe that this perinuclear actin is helping making the nuclear membrane more tense and that this is needed for uh, CPLA2 activation.
So um, this shows that ARP23 is required. Uh, we chose the NPF that is needed and will not show the data, actually the data from Roberto, uh, because um, for sake of time, but uh, um, I put it here, thanks to Fede and Roberto, we could show that in the WASP knockout, actually, up to, uh, the, there was no longer CCR7 up regulation upon confinement. And we decided finally to do the reverse experiment. Now we come and we inhibit the inhibitor. So this is a way of having cells that have more ARP23 expression. And uh, so we deleted ARP, we generated a knockout mouse, a flux allele again, crossed with CD11, C3 for the ARP knockouts. So we have these cells that have more ARP23. Actually, you can see that they have a, 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 um, the ARP knockout have more fluorescence in their cortex in agreement with this. And now we look at CPLA2 translocation into the nucleus. And there, I have to say, I was amazed by this result because what we did, did by doing that is to shift the threshold, the mechanosensing threshold of dendritic cell, which now are able to translocate CPLA2 into the nucleus, even when they are confined at four micron height. So four micron height is really a slight confinement, uh, I mean, an important confinement on the cell, but a slight confinement on the nucleus. But then it's enough to trigger the CPLA2 activation. And accordingly, it's also enough to trigger CCR7 up regulation. So uh, uh, we, 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 we were able also to observe this central pool of actin, which uh, emerged in RP knockout already confined at four micron height, but are not seen in most wild type cells confined at four micron height. So all this together is uh, saying that there's a pathway, mechanosensing pathway driven by CPLA2, and that this pathway is being tuned in dendritic cell by the expression of RP and by the level of activity of ARP23, which is regulated by many means. And depending on whether this is high or not, the cell will respond to the external mechanical stimulation. So we were excited about that. However, uh, this still says that it can happen, it doesn't say that it does happen in vivo. So we still needed to do the experiment uh, to check the number of dendritic cells in the lymph node of CPLA2 knockout mice. And uh, what we observed is that they were indeed decreased. This is the uh, skin draining lymph node uh, of CPLA2 knockout mice. You see that at steady state without any stimulation, you have less of uh, 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 dendritic cells from the DC2 type because these are the main uh, dendritic cells that migrate at steady states in the mouse skin and from the mouse skin to the draining leaf node story. And uh, uh, thanks to Julia, we also were able to show that there was a decrease at steady state of the migration of dendritic cells in wasp knockout mice. To the opposite, when we did this experiment in the RP knockout, so dendritic cells that have more ARP23 activity, we found that there are more of the dendritic cells in uh, the lymph node uh, of these animals. So. Uh, all these together, uh, uh, yes, forgot to say that in all these animal models, we found no normal number of dendritic cells in the, in the skin. So this suggests that it's not about a developmental defect, but really about uh, a, a defect in the homeostatic migration from the peri to lymph node. So there's a shape sensing by dendritic cells, suggesting that our initial hypothesis was uh, correct. And uh, this uh, is regulated by ARP23 and mediated by CPLA2, a lipid metabolism enzyme, and it's contributing at steady state to the migration of dendritic cells from the periphery to lymph node. Uh, of note, we don't say that this is the only signal. There could be other environmental signals that are contributing as well. There are still some cells in the lymph node of these mice. So um, yes, so 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 so, so the, it's 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 likely to happen to not be the only signal that exists, but it's the first one to be convincingly identified. I, I believe. Okay, so all this has been about CCR7 expression, but. Is this only about CCR7 expression? Actually, we could imagine that this pathway does not only upregulate CCR7 expression, but globally reprogram 
uh, uh, the dendritic cell. And to assess this question, we did uh, we profiled unconfined and confined dendritic cells that express or not CPLA2. I didn't say, but actually, if you have questions, you can interrupt me. I, I don't mind. I like a lively seminar. So do not hesitate to, I should have said that at the beginning, but do not hesitate to interrupt me if you have any questions. Okay, so profiling wild type and CPLA2 knockout dendritic cells, we observed that when the cells were not confined, there's absolutely no difference, no significant difference overall between wild type and CPLA2 knockout. Okay, so it means that this enzyme does not seem to be changing the transcriptional program of disease in the absence of any mechanical stimulus. However, when the cells are confined at three micron height, this completely changed the picture. Now we realize that there's a massive reprogramming of the dendritic cell transcription in response to confinement, and that uh, most of it, but not all actually, but most of it is CPLA2 dependent. Okay, so there's about 2,000 genes that are being upregulated and 800 genes that are being downregulated in a CPLA2 dependent manner. I will focus on the upregulated ones. So what we observed is that if you do a pathway analysis on those genes, you mainly find genes related to the immune function of dendritic cell, such as cytokine production, uh, uh, response to innate sensing, uh, antigen presentation, interference signaling, and also this pathway, which is quite interesting, I will uh, explain later on, which is TNF receptor non-canonical NF-kappa B pathway. So these are the 2000 genes, the analysis, pathway analysis on the 2000 genes upregulated. Now, if we go to the 103 genes that really behave like CCR7, we can focus on those 103 genes. So here the result was very interesting, first because among the genes that were upregulated by confinement at three micron height in a CPLA2 knockout as CCR7, uh, I mean, in a CPLA2 dependent manner as CCR7, they were the two main subunits of ARP23. So that mean, makes a lot of sense. Basically, when the cell is confined, it increases its level of ARP23 to better respond to the mechanical stimuli. In addition, there was this gene, Ikaka beta, which is really, really interesting because the paper that I, me I mentioned at the very beginning, which showed convincingly for the first time that steady state migration of dendritic cells was contributing to peripheral tolerance and preventing autoimmunity was indeed by using a knockout of Ikaka beta. So this race, so in Ikaka beta knockout, they showed in this paper that there was no longer homeostatic migration of dendritic cells. So we thought this raised the question that maybe CPLA2 and Ikaka beta are acting within the same pathway. Maybe CPLA2 is activating Ikaka beta. And we look at this. So uh, to, the first thing we look at is uh, uh, maybe to say Ikaka beta is a kinase that activates, uh, inactivate uh, uh, the inhibitor on F-kappa B. So when it's activated, it will lead to NF-kappa B activation and translocation into the nucleus. And what we observe is that indeed at three micron height, NF-kappa, when the cells are confined at three micron height, NF-kappa B is translocated within the nucleus of dendritic cells. And this does no longer occur if there is no CPLA2. So CPLA2 is upstream of uh, 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 NF suggests that CPLA2 is upstream of NF kappa beta, but this is confirmed by the following experiment. So here we inhibit Ikaka beta or we knock out Ikaka beta. And what do you see? When we confine the cells at three micron height, there's no longer CCR7 upregulation. So the, the response to confinement does no longer take place. And the opposite is not true. So if we now inhibit uh, the cells, but look at CPLA2 activation, we see that CPLA2 remains normally activated even when the cells are inhibited for this Ikaka beta and F-kappa B pathway. So indeed, CPLA2 is acting upstream. It's leading to the activation of Ikaka beta and F-kappa B, which is leading 
to CCR7 upregulation and in general to global reprogramming of the dendritic cells. I'm not showing the data, but uh, actually we found that uh, this is mediated at least in part by the prostaglandins that are produced in response to CPLA2 activation and that will activate the ikaka beta and f kappa pathway. So this is adding an extra player to a pa our pathway. Steady state migration of dendritic cells responds to these changes in cell shape. And it is mediated by CPLA2 upstream of this ikaka beta and f kappa b pathway. And uh, it requires up to three for the tuning of the pathway. Okay, so what does now if we uh, treat the cells with LPS and see whether this pathway is also playing a role with LPS. The result there for me was very striking because as for non-confined cells, we found that LPS treated dendritic cells. So this is a classical microbial activator of dendritic cells that is known to upregulate CCR7 and to reprogram the dendritic cell. And what we observe here is that there's absolutely no difference whether you have or not CPLA2, it doesn't matter. The CPLA2, the LPS response is completely normal. So you see in the clustering that only the confined cells separate between the two genotypes. I'm sorry, there's a lot of I minutes mean, more pain than on my computer and we lost the CPLA2 knockout, which is here. So only when the cells are confined, we see the separation. But we don't see it when the cells are non-confined or when the cells are treated by LP with LPS. And actually, if you dig into these 103 genes that behave like CCR7, you see that many of the genes, and in this case is the example of the type 1 interferon uh, genes that are being stimulated by both LPS and confinement, However, what is striking is that upon confinement, the level of stimulation is less. Most of the genes are shared by the two programs, but they are less upregulated by confinement than by LPS. And in addition, CPLA2 is only required for the upregulation of the same genes in response to confinement, but not in response to LPS. So that means that the two programs have overlapping. There's more than half of overlapping of the gene that is being induced by the two programs, are being induced by the two programs. However, uh, uh, only uh, uh, CPLA2 is only required for the mechanical one. And this is the first time that it was something specific identified for mechanic, uh, uh, the mechanic response of steady state migration of dendritic cells because the ikaka beta and fkappa b pathway that has previously described was, was required actually for the two responses. So if we dig into the, these genes, what are the difference between the two pathways, the mechanical one which is basically this uh, orange pathway and the LPS1, which is this pale blue. Well, there are several differences. If we look into the list of genes, as I said, there's more than half of the genes that are shared, but they're not upregulated or downregulated at the same levels by the, by the two pathways. Some of them are really important because they could be related to the tolerogenic function of dendritic cells, and this is uh, the regulation of T cell differentiation. So indeed, if you treat the cells by confinement or by LPS and you put them with CD40 cells, you see that the activation of CD40 cell is much bigger with LPS as compared to confined. This is an agreement with uh, uh, the cells, uh, uh, these cells not being as potent as antigen presenting cells and is also in agreement with these cells rather having a tolerogenic phenotype. So what we propose is that actually this reprogrammation that occurs at steady state when the cells activate the, the CPLA2 pathway is not only meant to send the dendritic cells to lymph nodes through the expression of CCR7, but also to put them in the right state for these cells to make it there and not inducing the activation of T cells, but rather inducing their tolerance. And there are also some interesting differences in some transcription factors that are particularly striking. For example, the STAT3 uh, CEBP that were an IRF1 that had been involved previously in the tolerogenic capacity of dendritic cells rather than in their activation. So finally, I think the really 
very final result that fully convinced me that this pathway was contributing to uh, the, 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 to the homeostatic migration of dendritic cell was this one. So what we took here is the list of genes that were described as being uh, upregulated, as being expressed by the disease that migrate to skin draining lymph node at steady state. And we compare it to the list of genes that are upregulated in vitro by disease upon confinement at three micron heights. And as you can see, comparing these two lists of genes, most of the genes are shared by the two pathways. So again, confirming that the pathway is uh, strongly arguing for this pathway being contributed to uh, the migration of disease to lymph node at steady state. So this is the general conclusion that dendritic cells that undergo nuclear deformation are being licensed to migrate to lymph nodes. I mean, this is exquisitely sensitive, so it's not all nuclear deformation. And that probably uh, we propose that this endows them with tolerogenic properties. We have done some very um, preliminary experiment in collaboration with Anne de Jean in Toulouse. And what she observed is that there's a tendency, but this is only one experiment with few mice, uh, uh, that CPD2 knockout mice seems to develop more, uh, um, um, sorry, multiple sclerosis like phenotype. And this is in the model where the MOG antigen is being injected in the mice. But we have to repeat that many other times, of course, to be fully convinced. Maybe another opening that could be interested for some of you that work on cancer is that CCR7 has also been shown to be involved for some cancer cells to escape from the primary tumor using the lymph node route. So this is one of the way cancer cells use to escape from the primary tumor. And, I'm oh no, sorry, this is not this, this is the next one. <laughs> ah, ah, I, I didn't put that actually, <laughs> sorry, got confused. Uh, and, and, and we believe that maybe the CPA2 pathway could be involved in the upregulation of CCR7 in cancer. Finally, uh, this is a, a, another interesting perspective. So there have been this CCR7 positive disease described recently in tumors as having a, kind of tolerogenic phenotype. And this has been described in human and in mice and uh, uh, by different groups actually. And uh, uh, we, we believe that these cells share a lot of properties with, uh, with our cells. And something that we would like to explore is whether our uh, access here is also leading to the upregulation of CCR7 into this tumor dendritic cell. And why we think it's relevant, it's because this pathway seemed to be respond at least in part to the engulfment of tumor cells and extracellular material by dendritic cell. And we think that when the cell engulf a lot of apoptotic cell body or of tumor cells or pieces of matrix, of course, there is uh, the possibility that this will lead to important mechanical deformation of the 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 the, the the phagocytic cell. So you see here a cell that has uh, 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 uptaken a piece of another cell, it's very necrotic actually, and you can see that the nucleus is extensively deformed. So maybe our pathway can also be uh, uh, activated in response to uptake of uh, uh, particles, apoptotic bodies, extracellular matrix. We are exploring this. For now, I have to say we find there's no defect, but still, um, it's, it's something too, too, too interesting to be further explored. And it's supported by the literature because it has been shown that CPLA2 can be activated by cholesterol, which is itself regulated by the uptake of apoptotic bites. And here we're coming the cancer cells. So CCR7 could be also used by cancer cells to form metastasis. This is shown in different papers. So could this pathway be used by the cancer cells? I think it's an interesting thing to be investigated. If anyone is interested, I'm happy to provide all the tools because we will not be doing that. Okay, here we go. So most of the people, most the main person involved in this project was Zara al -Rayes. So she started doing the master, the PhD, and then she stayed two extra years 
for the for the paper to be published. It was published actually in Nature Immunology uh, last spring in in, um, in this summer. This summer in Nature Immunology, uh, it's always long and hard. Um, she got help from many people in the lab here in Bold. And uh, lots of uh, and the, the thesis was co supervised by my uh, close collaborator Mathieu Pell. So actually, Fede said that I develop tools, but I don't develop any tool. <laughs> I just use the tools developed by, by my collaborator. He's a genius guy, and uh, uh, it has been really fun. We've been working together for twenty years. He does also a lot of dendritic cell in his lab, even though he's not an immunologist. And it's uh, it's uh, really fantastic. He. He taught me about physics that I didn't know anything about. And I really recommend interdisciplinarity to, I don't know, open your mind and think of things you've never heard of. And of course, the external collaboration, very important. Uh, I mentioned uh, uh, the most important one to be mentioned here is Federica and Roberto and Julia. Roberto helped with the uh, um, the 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 experiments with with wasp and Julia was knockout and Julia I mean both of them helped with the experiments with the wasp knockout. Thank you very much. <laughs>